um, glad uh, everyone could make it for the first talk of this session. I appreciate your being here. I'm going to talk about um, uh, L1 retrotransposons, um, their distribution across the tree of life, and uh, some of their evolutionary dynamics. So let's see, there we go. Right, so intro to, quick intro to transposable elements and L1s. Um, they're basically DNA sequences that can jump around genomes, and effectively they are classified into two classes. Uh, class 1s are RNA-mediated, class 2s are DNA-mediated. So DNA transposons are the ones that Barbara McClintock essentially discovered, and um, they don't, uh, they copy themselves around the genome uh, using a DNA intermediate. Retro elements, on the other hand, in the class 1 use an RNA intermediate. Those are subdivided into two classes one of which contains long terminal repeats, which are the LTR repeats. They are sort of similar to retroviral sequences in that they have a gag and Paul open reading frames. And then the non-LTR retro elements, which include the line elements, the L1s, and they have two open reading frames. Now, basically, they have somewhat different uh, retrotransposition mechanisms. So on the right, we have the DNA transposons. They basically encode a transposase that helps them move around. The class one elements, the non-LTR ones, contain two open reading frames, one of which um, binds to the transcript, the other which uh, can in fact uh, nick the DNA and then um, cause a reverse transcription so that the retrotransposon is copied back into the genome. So effectively, what you've got is a situation where the DNA transposons just copy themselves around, but they don't through a cut and paste mechanism, so they don't really expand in numbers, whereas these guys can make multiple copies and keep expanding and they colonize the genome and can account for large parts of the genome. Now, we don't really know what governs this process and we don't even really know how widespread this is across the tree of life in terms of what genomes in, terms of in, in, in eukaryotes are likely to, in fact, have lots of repeats or not. So in human, so we have three bioinformaticians in the wild here. Um, um, that's Atma, she's the primary author on this. Um, humans have around 44% of their genome uh, is um, repeats. And of those, of, of the total genome, 16% is L1s and L1 fragments. So you can, you can, you know, in mammals and in humans, this is a pretty significant part of the genome. And there's a lot of literature on these guys. So the L1s, again, just to recap really quickly, when we went looking for L1s across the tree of life, this is what an L1 looks like. It's about 6 KB long. It's got two open reading frames. This one here is really the one that we're interested in, ORF2. It has an endonuclease domain and a reverse transcriptase domain. We define one of these as being active or potentially active if this ORF is intact. And we define intact as if they are 80% or more of the expected length, they don't have any premature stop codons, and they contain the known domains we expect, such as the reverse transcriptase domain. So we went looking across the tree of life. Our data set included genomes from 503 species, everything we could scrape off the internet, plus four that were available um, from people that hadn't yet published them. And as you can see, they're pretty well scattered across the tree of life. We've got um, ectozoa, we got ray fin fish, mammals, reptiles, plants, flatworms. And we had a method for finding L1s, and these was basically alignment-based and an iterative-based, uh, iterative approach. So if effectively, we start with um, known L1 sequences that we had either identified or were in rep base. We aligned them to all the genomes. Everything we pulled out, we then clustered and then globally aligned, created a consensus. We stuck those consensus sequences back in as queries and we recycled and we redid the process. And we redid that until we didn't recover any more repetitive elements once we had exhaustively sampled those genomes. So once we had done that, how many of those species showed L1s in them? So those little purple stars scattered around the outside, that's where we found some evidence of L1s, um, either full length or fragmented sequences. And you can see um, there are some parts of the tree of life that 
are pretty sparse in terms of the content, but otherwise they're L1s mostly uh, pretty much everywhere we looked. But it's not always perfect, and so there are some species that lack. Mammals, all mammals, except for monotremes, <laughs> contain L1s. We couldn't even find any fragments of L1s in monotremes, and this is something I think I might save for a future talk. Now, the real question, though, is when you find these, how many of these species have L1s that are active or potentially active? Are they full length? Do they have uh, competent open reading frames for retrotransposition? So how many of them contain active L1s? Um, this is what happens when you now superimpose on top of the previous figure, um, effectively the counts for the um, L1s. And so in blue, we have full length, but um, not active. So in other words, they didn't have what appeared to be um, competent or intact uh, ORF2s. In red, we have the counts for active L1, so they had uh, functional ORF2s by our definition. And you can see straight away that mammals are special, okay? Uh, mammals are special in that they have lots and lots of full-length L1s. Um, and uh, a fair proportion of active L1s, depending on the species, but it's not entirely uniform. Um, you otherwise find uh, plants also have some L1s, but pretty much everywhere else, um, there's evidence of L1s that they want once in the genome, but you don't really find any um, relics that look like they've been recently functional, which is kind of interesting. So you can take that previous data that I just showed and you can replot it this way to get a feel for sort of what's going on. Now across the bottom axis, what we've got is the percent of L1s that we find in the genome that look like they are active. So in other words, that meet our criterion for being active. And on the y-axis, what we've got is the number of active L1s and we've got a log scale here. I'll just draw that to your attention. So uh, in different colors here, we have mammals in black and they sort of form this arc like so. We have plants here, which are sort of scattered through here, and we have some non-mammalian animals, which are sort of splattered around here in red. Effectively, what you can say then is that you can define a group of organisms which we would call um, high potential but low activity. So they have L1s, okay? They don't have very many of them, but they have a high proportion of that small number looks like they are competent to retrotranspose, but they don't have a lot of them in the genome, so that's kind of puzzling. And then you have these guys. They have high potential, they have more than 20% potentially active L1s, but they have thousands of full-length L1s, okay? And interestingly enough, if you think about it, we are there. Most of the publications about L1s are done here in human, but we are not actually a good experimental organism to understand how these things actually work and how they colonize genomes. We should really be working on the minke whale or the snub-nosed monkey to see how these things evolve and how they can colonize genomes because there are many more full-length ones and many more active ones look, looking like currently active ones in those genomes. And in fact, if we look at the snub-nosed monkey, um, what we've got here is um, a master lineage for the L1. So in, in this particular genome, all of the L1s can be clustered together into a single master lineage. Uh, not true for all organisms. Sometimes you find multiple families. But in this case, a single master lineage. And what we've done is we've now superimposed. So we've done the alignments based on the nucleotide sequences of those full-length L1s. And we've now labeled them by color depending on whether or not they have intact ORF2, intact ORF1, are both intact ORFs. And so you can see ORF2 intacts tend to cluster down at the short branches, so they're recently active, less divergence, and the same is true for the ORF ones. But the ORF2 is really the important ones because they're the ones that retrotranspose, that control whether something can retrotranspose. And snub-nosed monkeys, you think they might be cute, well, they can be cute. Not always cute, but they can be cute. So you look at whichever one of those you favor. So ORF2 domain structure is pretty conserved, but what about ORF1s? So ORF1s have been traditionally classified as either type 1 or type 2s. Type 2s are what we find um, effectively in mammals and uh, in animals largely, and they encode um, proteins which have got uh, coiled coil, 
uh, RNA recognition motif in a carboxy terminal domain. Uh, they call these the transposase 22s. And then in type 1s, we have more RNA recognition motifs in some zinc fingers, but there are variants of type 1 that have been found in different organisms. We can find some in mosquitoes that look like this. We can find some in sea squirts that look like this. We can find some in mosquitoes and plants that look like this, and some in plants that just look like this, okay? So there's some variation about in terms of the structure of ORF1. And in fact, when we started looking, the really interesting thing I think here is that we find a, a, a new unknown type of ORF1, which contains a helix turn, helix domain, and it actually is quite similar to things you find in bacteria. So again, kind of a curveball in terms of trying to understand what's going on. And if you look at the species distribution for these things, so the number of species that contain these things, and um, what you find here, again, labeled mammals, plants, and non-mammalian animals. Here's where the mammals are. We have some non-mammalian animals here in the transpos transposase 22 type, but plants are pretty much over here and these are mostly mosquitoes and sea squirts right here. And then we have some algae sitting over here with the HTHs. Now, we can take those ORF1s and we can cluster them based on their sequence characteristics. Uh, and then we, and so we're only doing the ORF1s from plants and non-mammalian animals here because if we threw in the transposase 22s, it would just be one big hairball in the middle and you it would sort of obscure what we're seeing in these others. And it's not very instructive. It's one big interconnected blob if you, if you look at the animals. But here, what we see is um, you've got the, uh, the brassica present here and here and here. So three clusters, effectively, independent clusters for the brassica, but roughly the same domain structure, but they cluster differently because it's... Um, They've actually diverged a fair bit in terms of their indels and substitution. So even though these things look the same and they can be assigned to the same um, sort of domain structure, their sequences have diverged enough to make them cluster into three different uh, types. However, interestingly enough, in the karyophyllis, what we see is a single cluster, single connected cluster, but there are actually two different domain types of domain structures present in it. But sequence-wise, there's enough identity probably driven by this middle domain here that is pulling all of these together. And then the green algae sit here. We have sea squirts here, okay, with their kind of oddball ORF1 structure. And here we have mosquitoes. We looked at five different uh, species of mosquitoes. There's actually three different species of mosquitoes co-clustering together here with the same type of ORF1 structure. So what can we conclude? So we looked for L1s across the tree of life, and we found out of 503 different species, 499 of these are in the public domain, we found 335 um, that contained L1 sequences, okay? We found um, that there's a fair bit of L1 extinction in modern species. By extinction, meaning that we can find L1 fragments in them, so they were active in those species at some time, or they came from some common ancestor, Okay, but they're no longer active now. This is particularly true outside of mammals. But interestingly enough, and this, is, this extinction of L1s is much more widespread than previously believed. Mammals are basically special. They have lots of L1s. And so, of course, because we tend to study ourselves and mice and these kinds of things, and they have lots of L1s, we assume everything has lots of L1s. This is not true. Mammals in general have lots of L1s, but even across the mammals, some mammals have more than we do, and some have more active L1s than we do. We have some hyperactive species, like the minke whale and the snub-nosed monkey, and they have very, very high levels of L1 activity. They would be good model organisms, probably, to study the evolution of these elements, and we're going to pursue this probably a bit further. The really uh, other thing that we found that was a bit of a surprise, the ORF1 structure. Um, it varies wildly in non-mammalian species, particularly in plants. And I think we're probably due for a new classification system <laughs> because um, we can't just classify everything as a type 1 variant. We actually have to be a little bit more intelligent about it, I think. Um, the, the issue with this is that Again, there's biochemical studies that claim that the ORF1 present in human or mouse can, in fact, uh, help chaperone the transcript into the nucleus as part of the retrotransposition 
process, how can they be so different across different taxa and still fulfill the same function? That's kind of an interesting thing from uh, a biochemical perspective. I think there's probably some, some interesting work to be done there. Um, if you want to read more about this, it's, there's a preprint on BioArchive. Um, manuscript is currently in revision. Hopefully we'll get the revisions in in the next couple of weeks. And so the only other thing I'd like to say is I'd like to thank members of my lab, in particular Atma, who is uh, just finishing her PhD in a couple of months. And so if any of you are looking for a really good postdoc, <laughs> You know, she is truly excellent. Uh, she had an undergrad degree in applied maths. She's been doing her PhD with me. Um, she can code, she can write, she's fantastic. Uh, so um, I would definitely recommend her. Uh, this guy here who likes, doesn't like to have his picture taken is Dan Korchak, he's her co-supervisor, also works in my lab. And I think with that, I'll um, wait for questions. <laughs>